cable deterioration before the fall. Today, we'll be talking about some important diagnostic methods for your cable, like with stand testing, 10 delta testing, and PD testing. My name is Yir Cho. I'm the marketing communications engineer for Mega North America, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. If you have any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session, I will be supporting you. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red. You may also notice that there are two audio options, telephone and mic and speakers. The mic and speaker options uses V over IP, so you may experience intermittent audio lag during, uh, due to bandwidth. At any time during the presentation, you can switch to the telephone audio option. You will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards, and remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and I will interject your questions to the presenter as we have time. Our presenter today is Tina Carson, Mega's application engineer for cable products. Tina is based out of Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining us, Tina. Thanks, Jir. Um, I'm actually pretty excited to be able to go over this diagnostic uh, webinar. I, mean, I get a lot of questions asked all the time about what tests to do what and when, and so I'm, I'm happy to be able to do this. Um, all right, so um, uh, like Jir said, I'm going to go over detecting cable deterioration before the fault, which is essentially a bunch of diagnostic methods. And the topics I'm hoping to cover are um, even the basics, like the parts of the cable, wire testing your cables, um, different cable types, and of course various testing methods like your withstand testing, uh, what very low frequency is, which is a big question, um, VLS withstand testing, hand delta diagnostics, and partial discharge diagnostic. So this is hoping what I'm covering. Hope hopefully I'll be able to cover all this stuff right here very clearly. All right. Um, but um, to kind of establish a baseline and go over the uh, the generic stuff for cables, I really want to go over the parts of the cables and um, to get a good familiar, familiarity. Alrighty, so starting with the cable, uh, we have the conductor on top, of course, and typically it's made out of copper or aluminum. It's um, solid or stranded. Next, we have our conductor shield, and then we have the insulation, and the insulation, there's various types of insulation, various colors, and we'll go over that as well. And then we have the insulation shield. And the insulation shield is also commonly known as a semicon. And then we have our metallic shield. And there's different names for the metallic shield because there's different types of shields. Like uh, we have concentric neutral wire. We have tape shields out there. There's flat wires. There's string wires. They're all types of metallic shields. And then we have our jacket. And the jacket is our moisture barrier for our cable. Um, typically, it has stuff like the manufacturing uh, manufacturer on there, or the cable rating, or the insulation type, um, stuff like that on the jacket. So those are your basics of your cable. And um, why are we testing cables? Well, um, throughout the cable's life, they're actually subjected to various types of stresses. Like you have thermal stresses from short circuit current, or electrical stresses from transient. Um, you can have mechanical stresses from the bending radius being too tight. And of course, you have environmental issues like being in a high moisture area, or being in a high area or something. But all these stresses will age and degrade the cable over time, which of course leads up to cable failures. And uh, one of the leading aging conditions of medium voltage cables is something called a water tree. And a water tree is moisture that's stuck inside the cable, and it forms a tree-like structure, or like a bush-like structure. And all you need to have a water tree are three ingredients. You need AC voltage, you need moisture, and time. And if you have these three ingredients, you can have potentially water trees inside your cable. And you can only have, you can also have um, not just like one water tree, you could actually have them all over your cable. They could be coming from the conductor, they could be coming from the semicon, but only one of these guys needs to convert to something called an electrical tree, which is a carbonized path to create a, um, a cable failure. All right. And because you can have water trees all over your cable, um, this is considered something like a global issue. And you also have more localized issues, of course, like if you have a bad joint, um, you can have a bad termination. Um, you can have a localized weak spot, like a bad um, 
like a localized water tree or like an installation dig in, something like that. That's right. And so when it comes to testing, there are three different occasions that people test. Uh, the first one is for commissioning. And so um, you're checking your cable system before you actually put some service to make sure making sure everything's okay. Um, someone could have done a repair on the cable, and so you're checking to see if the repair is going to hold. And then there's also, of course, there's maintenance testing, which checks the condition of the cable system. All right. So um, what tests are there? Uh, what can you do um, to do testing? Like which test does what? Um, there's various types of tests. Um, like I was saying earlier, there's the withstand test. And there's three different versions. You have a DC withstand test. You have an AC power frequency withstand test. Um, there's an AC VLS withstand test. And of course, there's 10 delta diagnostics and partial discharge diagnostics. And each test has a different purpose. And just as a little FYI, there is something called a sheath test, which tests the jacket. And there's something called conductor resistance that you could use to check the conductor continuity as well. But um, I'm mainly going to go over the withstand test, 10 delta dust diagnostics, and partial discharge. All righty. All right, so starting off, I'm going to start with the withstand test and tell you about what it does and what is it. Alrighty, so um, what is a withstand test? Um, it is, all it is is a high potential test. And you can test with AC or DC. And all you do is you bring up the voltage level to a certain level and you hold it. And you hold it there for a certain amount of time. And what it's looking for um, is checks for major defects in the cable. And essentially, it's a pass-fail type test. It either holds the voltage or it does not hold the voltage. And common with DC, you measure something called leakage current or the insulation resistance value, which can kind of make it like a diagnostic, but essentially it's a, it's a pass-fail test. Um, do know that if you run this test, that you will need a contingency plan. Because if the cable fails, you cannot re-energize the cable. And so you want to make sure um, you have um, fault location equipment, because you could find the defect and repair it or um, just backup cable if you need to replace it. So there, there's a little confusion on which standard to use when you're running a, say, a DC with stand test. And this really is dependent on the cable category. Um, and there are two main categories. There's um, laminated cables and they're extruded type cables. So um, laminated cables, these are your paper cables, or paper insulation type cables, your pipe type cables your PILC cables, which stands for Paper Insulated Lead Covered Cables. And essentially what this is, is the insulation is made out of paper. And then it's impregnated with oil to give it dielectric strength, or insulation strength. Um, your extruded cables are your EPR cables and your XLPE cables. And your EPR cables, the insulation tends to be um, reddish, or pinkish, or brown, or black. And then when you have an XLPE cable, the insulation looks white, or off-white, or maybe pale yellowish, or pale blue, or transparent. Um, so those are extruded type cables. So coming back to withstand testing for DC, um, there is a IEEE guideline for DC testing for laminated cables. You can look at the IEEE 400.1. And um, you could use this as a guideline. But uh, do you know that this is not a guideline for your extruded type cables, like your XLPE and your um, EPR cables? And so what is your IEEE guideline? Well, in fact, there's actually no IEEE guideline anymore for extruded dielectric cables for DC testing. And there's actually, um, it's actually a no longer an approved method. And there's two main reasons why. Um, one is called the space charge effect. And the other one is essentially you could pass bad cables, like it's blind to certain defects. So what do I mean by um, space charge effect? So when you're DC testing, um, you could actually leave charges behind in the insulation. And these charges uh, won't bleed off of the insulation. So they kind of embed themselves somewhere in the insulation. And um, they just kind of sit there, essentially. And then you put this cable back in service. And so you already have a little space charge, and then you add all the other charges to it, 
and it breaks down that section faster. And so it actually harms your cable. Um, for passing bad cables, well, uh, let me give you an example. So there's an experiment run on two types of cables, your laminated cables and your extruded cables, or your XLPE and a silk cable. And what they did is they ran um, AC tests on it and DC tests on it. And uh, of course they created a fault. So your XLPE cable, they actually pushed a needle in the cable and they created a fault. And with your PILT cable, they drilled a hole inside the cable. So they created a fault in both types of the cables and they tested it with AC and DC. And every time they tested it with AC, a fault occurred. And then they tested it with DC and even up to 10 times operating voltage, nothing happened, uh, which is a little unnerving. And so they went to the PILT cable, they, they did the same thing. They tested it with AC and every time they tested with AC, a fault occurred. And every time they tested it with DC, nothing happened. And so if you're checking your cables with DC, you could potentially pass a bad cable. And so you have to kind of walk away and say, like, did I just pass something that's bad? And aside from having the space charges harming your cable for your extruded type, um, you could essentially pass bad cables. So these are two main reasons why DC testing is no longer recommended. Um, and even with your pulk cables, I mean, you could, it's a laminated type cable, but again, it, it, AC just seems a little more efficient. So if you're not testing with DC, what can you use? Um, like I'm implying, you should use an AC test, but now it comes to the point of, well, do I use power frequency testing or do I use VLF? And what is VLF? And just as an update, a uh, uh, quick update, the VLF just stands for very low frequency. And so you use a frequency of 0.1 hertz. So what's the difference between these two guys? Well, the difference actually stands out with a power requirement. So between going between power frequency or 60 hertz and 0.1 hertz, there's a 600 times difference between the two. So there's also 600 times less power needed for a VLF test. And what does that look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. This is a big equation for how much power you need to test a cable with. And say you're just doing a 15 kV cable that's um, only 1,000 feet long. Well, if you're following the IEEE guidelines, this takes over around 20,000 watts to do. <laughs> And if you increase your length or increase your size, you're just going to go up in power. Um, so it's almost testing with KVA as opposed to 25 VA. So um, with VLF, it only takes a few watts to do this. So it makes a difference between testing with like a portable substation or a gigantic unit or a small portable unit. So it's actually, uh, you have more options. You have uh, units that are small, easy, and portable for your VLF testing as opposed to trying to move around the substation. So a lot of people are moving towards your VLF, which just stands for very low frequency. It's a 0.1 hertz method, AC method, of course. And of course, it has a more portable <laughs> aspect to it, uh, since you have a lot less power requirements. And this is an FYI, HCW made the first VLF unit in 1987. All right, so what is a VLF withstand test? Um, VLF withstand is just an AC withstand test, and it's a high pot test that uses a 0.1 hertz frequency, and it still checks your major defects in your cable, and this one you can use on extruded cables and laminated cables, but again, essentially it's a pass-fail test, and you'll, you'll still need a contingency plan. And over here on the right-hand side, you can see this cable, and uh, if you can kind of look at this closely, there's a bubble right there in the heat shrink. And apparently someone just didn't shrink it all the way. And this caused something called partial discharge or little discharges uh, to occur. And this caused a breakdown. So something as simple as a um, incomplete shrinking could cause a breakdown. And this is what a VLF test um, could detect and can find. So how do you run the test? Um, you need to know four parameters. You need to know the frequency. Uh, you need to know the waveform, uh, your voltage level, and your test time. And um, so frequency, uh, pretty easy. You want to use 0.1 hertz. Then uh, for your waveform, you have two options. You have uh, sinusoidal and cosine rectangular. And then for your voltage level and test time, I'll go over those in a little more detail. So 
Um, for your voltage level, it's actually determined by uh, where your cable is in its life. So if you have a brand new cable that, um, say, it's been cut off the reel, but you haven't added termination, um, so you would run the installation test. And um, in the next, say, if the cable has um, it has not been put in service, but you have added termination, this is where you'd run the acceptance test. And say the cable's aged for 10 years, um, this is where you use the maintenance test. And each test goes to a different voltage level. And of course, the voltage level is also dependent on the cable rating. So you're going to have a different voltage level for a 5 kV cable than you will a 15 kV cable. So how do you read the chart on the voltage level? So the IEEE provides a suggestion or a guideline. Um, the IEEE 400.2 Table 3 um, gives a list of voltages that you can select using either your sinusoidal waveform or your cosine rectangular, whatever you have. So I'm going to go over just quickly on how do you read this chart. So, um, all right. So on the left-hand side, you're first going to pick you're going to pick your waveform first. So let's say we're using a sinusoidal waveform unit. So we look in this column. Uh, next, we, we're going to look at our cable rating. So let's say we have a 5 kV cable. So we can look at this line right here. And then let's say we have a cable that's been in service for, uh, again, 10 years. And so we're going to run our maintenance test. And we look over here, and we see um, two different voltages, one in RMS, one in peak. This is really up for your preference. Um, some units dial up in peak, some dial up in RMS. Just be aware of which one uh, you're dialing up in and pick the appropriate voltage. So let's say we have a, a, a unit that dials up in RMS, so we pick 7 kV. So that's how you read the chart. Pretty straightforward. All right. All right, so the last thing I'm going to go over was um, how to run a test is the test time. And the um, test time, just so you know, the IEEE recommends doing a 30 minutes minimum test to maximum of one hour. And I get in constant discussions on, like, do I really have to test this long? Why do I have to test this long? Um, and so what I would like to know is, you know, um, what actually happens during this test? because that helps me answer, it gives me a good backing to recommending the 30 minutes to 60 minutes. So what happens during a VLF with sand test? Um, what it does, it actually accelerates an, an already existing aging condition inside the cable. And of course, you're doing this in a nice controlled environment because you, you, you know you've, you've scheduled this. But um, so again, it's accelerating any existing aging condition. And so it's going to trigger any sort of partial discharge or electrical discharges inside your cable. And uh, remember those water trees? If they get big enough or get big, kind of big, they become critically sized. And it converts all the critically sized water trees into those electrical trees. And that brings it to failure within that controlled, scheduled environment. And so, of course, you want to make sure you grow these things or you're triggering your PD. And this, this takes time. So the acceleration of the growth rate will take a little time. The growth of the trees will take a little time. Um, the triggering of PD will cause a breakdown over time. And so you want to extend that test time out as long as you can. And again, 30 minutes to an hour should get everything. And if you don't use all this time, you don't want to partially grow something and then put it back. So that's why you want to test that length of time. Um, so overall, your withstand test, um, you're gathering basic information about your cable. Um, you're able to weed out your bad cables by growing those electrical trees to failure in that controlled environment and triggering that PD in that controlled environment. Um, unfortunately, the withstand test, it doesn't tell you like how lofty my cable is. Do I have small water trees? Like How good of quality is this cable? And it doesn't localize the defect. But um, these, this is pretty much the essentials for your of your withstand testing. Are there um, any questions that I could take on withstand testing? Any thoughts? Um, um, I have a question from 
the audience. So they okay. said that they've encountered a situation where the cable failed in 24 hours after passing a VLF with send test. Um, do you have any idea what would cause that? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there, there could be a couple things. So um, again, a lot of times people will kind of cheat their test time. And so they'll do, instead of doing an hour test, they'll do like a 10 minute test or 15 minute test. And like statistically, you get a good majority of within those 15 minutes. But a lot of times they'll partially grow something and then they put it in service and then it grows the rest of the way and it fails. And that happens quite often because most of the time people don't test it right. They don't uh, apply the right, right amount of voltage or they don't test it long enough. And that tends to cause failure shortly after it's put back in service. That's what I've found so far. Okay, Any other thank questions? you. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Nope, that's it for now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next topic. Um, so, if, of course, if your withstand test doesn't provide a lot of information on the cable insulation, like the quality, uh, what test do I need to run? And there's two more diagnostics. There is um, your CAN delta diagnostic and partial discharge diagnostic. And so CAN delta, I'll go ahead and go over that next. All right. So um, what is CAN delta? Uh, CAN delta is just for information out there, also is known as dissipation factor. It um, uses a frequency of 0.1 hertz in a sinusoidal waveform. And you can find guidelines for this in the IEEE 400.2. And so what is it? Um, it's looking at it looks at, or it is the ratio of two currents, <laughs> one being the uh, like the real current or resistive current, and the other one being capacitive current. And wh where do these currents come from? There are, the cable itself, it could be modeled as the capacitor and resistor in parallel. And the capacitor comes from uh, two plates in a dielectric. And what that is in a cable is if you have the conductor as one plate, um, and then you have um, the metallic shield as the other, and then you have your um, insulation serving as the dielectric. So that's where the capacitor comes from. And any sort of losses inside your cable, like caused from water trees or voids or whatnot, um, this is where the resistor comes in. And if you had a perfect cable, an absolutely wonderful perfect cable, um, you would have nothing but your capacitive current in there. But because you have, uh, because no cable is perfect, you're going to have a little bit of loss in there. And so um, when you have more losses, it actually creates a greater angle between these two currents. And that angle is called delta. And to get the ratio of the two currents, um, you take the tangent of the angle delta. So that's where tan delta comes from. But what tan delta is used to detect, um, kind of like I was saying, the more loss to your cable, the greater this angle is going to become between the two, the greater tan delta number. And so it could, use, it could be used to detect voids or water trees or leakage because all this makes the, that resistant current go up or even metallic shield corrosion. And so when you're testing with tan delta, you're actually looking at the reliability of the cable installation and the, even the determinations for some more advanced users out there, which is kind of nice. So essentially you can look at the health of the cable by um, using a tan delta diagnostic. Um, the test itself is actually pretty simple. It's actually, uh, there's only three steps for the test. And each step is based off the operating voltage. And so your first step is half operating voltage. And then your next step is operating voltage. And then your last step is 1.5 times operating voltage. And at each step, you take 5 to 10 readings, um, 5 to 10 10 delta readings. So this is pretty much how you run the test. <laughs> pretty, pretty easy. And here, of course, this just represents your voltage level, and there's 10 values at that voltage level. And you all have a tan delta number uh, given to you. Um, as opposed to withstand testing, just being pass or fail, you actually have three criteria uh, to evaluate your cable when you use tan delta diagnostic. Um, the first one is called uh, mean tan delta, and then you use the, something called a differential, and then last, you use something called stability. What are these numbers, or what are these evaluation criteria? All right, so, um, like I just said, you have um, three steps, and at each step you take about five to ten readings. And what the mean tan delta is 
10 delta value is, it's just the average value of these readings. So each step you average the value and you give a reading. So um, you'll have three mean 10 delta numbers. <laughs> uh, the differential is the literal difference between the first and third step. And so if you have a mean 10 delta number of 10 at the last step and then one at the first step, it's 10 minus one. And so your differential is nine. So it's just a little difference between the first and third step. And this is also known as, um, referred to as your delta 10 delta or your tip up. And essentially when you have, when you're running a 10 delta test, you want each number to be really low and very, very consistent. Because when it's low, that means it has less losses. And a new cable, you're gonna have uh, no losses, and so you're gonna see a straight line and your differential is gonna be zero, or essentially zero. And the more this thing starts to tip up or increase, the more it shows aging and degradation. And then last, we have something called stability. And then stability is also known as standard deviation. And what is standard deviation. All right, so again, we're taking five to 10 readings per step. And really all it is is how much standard deviation is, how much each reading deviated from the average. And so if all your readings are really close together, they don't deviate very far from that average. They're really close and very consistent. So your standard deviation is gonna be low. Um, say if you have kind of widespread numbers, they're going all over the place, uh, like really high numbers, really low numbers, and you kind of average out the summer, we're like really in the middle. Um, this is this is not a good sign because your unit is having trouble figuring out what your cable's doing or your cable's degrading. And so if you have something like this, you kind of want to uh, maybe check your cable setup or there could be something that's wrong with your cable. Okay. So what numbers are good? What numbers are bad? Um, the IEEE 400.2 actually provides charts for you, so you can actually grade your cable um, based on past history, which is nice. And there's three types of the three assessments that, that can be made. One is called no action required. Um, another one's called further study advised or action required. And essentially what this is is good, okay, and bad. And what you can do, you can take these numbers and uh, look at this chart and grade your cable and see where it falls, like if it's good, if it's okay, or if it's bad. And of course, the IEEE has um, recommended, or recommendations of repetition. So if your cable looks good, you really don't have to perform this test for another five years. But if it's okay, then you might want to do it annually. And also note that this is installation type dependent. And so you're going to have different numbers for your um, different colors of PR or XLPE and even pilt cables. All right, so um, as an example, uh, I'll just do an example evaluation. So say we tested the cable, oh, go back. And we had these numbers right here at the bottom, um, right in this area. We got a little, some results here. What you do is you just look at these numbers and you bring it to this chart. And so, oops, sorry. And so let's say we have a pink EPR cable. We would look, look at these numbers and look at this chart. And so our first column is our stability. So we would look at, I'm going to be the optimist, and look at our pink EPR and say, okay, at operating voltage, which is what it says in here, my stability has to be less than 0.1, and I have 0 0.09, so that checks out. And then my differential, which is the next column that I have to grade it by, I have 0.6, and it has to be less than 4. So, so far this is great. And then um, it has to have a mean VLF 10 delta at the operating voltage. So I'm looking at my operating voltage um, 10 delta number. I have 0.65, and it has to be less than 20 to be good. So this cable, it looks great. I would pass this cable very easily. And that's how you do an, an analysis. So essentially when you're running a 10 delta test, um, you can get a really good assessment of your cable insulation. 
and this test is monitored. So at each step, you're actually seeing how the cable is doing. And so at each voltage level, you can see how the cable is behaving. And you can even use this tan delta test to monitor a withstand test. And so you can see how the withstand test is doing, or at least get some sort of insight. And so you're not doing a completely blind test. And of course, what it's used for, tan delta is used for, um, to detect water trees, metallic shield corrosion, voids, anything that can cause leakage or um, leakage currents, of course. And of course, you could gauge your cable's health using these charts. Um, Unfortunately, tan delta diagnostics does not uh, localize any of your defects. But essentially, uh, I guess we've gone, a little, gone over a little bit of the theory. Uh, we've gone over um, how to run the test uh, and um, how to kind of grade a cable. Are there any questions on tan delta diagnostics? Or yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, so Annie wants to know if you could perform a 10 delta VLF on EPR cables with multiple splices that have the shields connected to the splice and also connected to the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, you can test through splices. Um, the test is run between the conductor and the shield. And so when you get to an unshielded section of the cable, you can get a little bit of crazy results. And so I'm not sure how well it would do. And so people tend to ground, if you have splices and you know the splices are grounded, and but not like a continuing connection between the next cable, or if there's a break, people tend to ground both sides of the cable at that point. So at least there'll be some sort of continuity. Um, and also when you have multiple splices, like say if you have brown EPR mixed with pink EPR and the different types of EPR, um, you'll have something called a hybrid cable. And then, honestly, you have to just judge the cable with the highest numbers. So if you have, if, say, if black EPR has the highest numbers on the 10 delta chart, you just have to grade the rest of it um, using those numbers because you don't want to uh, fail the that section using, say, the pink section with lower numbers. So it gets a little tricky. But anyway, um, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> And another one from Steve. Um, could a broken lead shield cause an elevated 10 delta, but not a tip up on a pilt cable? Um, hmm. It can cause an elevated 10 delta. Uh, I, I guess it depends. Each cable is a little different, so I can't really fully answer that question, unfortunately. I mean, it can potentially increase both, and it can increase your tip up. It it really depends on it's a, there's a lot of factors that would go with that. Okay, and one last question from Felix: um, When we're doing VLF 10 delta on a long cable, do you require resonating inductors? Um, hmm. I guess I would have to talk with Philip about that one. It, as far as I've heard, I haven't I haven't heard any issues with inductance, um, especially with VLF and, um, but, and and in medium voltage. So maybe we could discuss that or I could give them a, give you a call, Philip, about what's going on with there. But I, I've never personally I haven't had any issues with that. Um, I guess um, next question. <laughs> Um, I think we're good for now. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to partial discharge diagnostics. So first, um, what are partial discharges? Um, they are electrical. They're discharges or electrical sparks in an air-filled void or cavity, and they only partially go across the cable. So if you can kind of look at the right-hand side, um, there's a full discharge, which goes across the, like essentially is a fault that goes across the insulation. And there's a partial discharge, which only goes partially um, in, across the insulation, like it stays kind of within that void. So that's what partial discharge is. It's just a partial um, discharge 
or a partial spark across an air-filled gap or a cavity or void. And these could also occur at high stress points. Um, there's something called corona, which is really a subcategory of partial discharge. And um, because partial discharge is you know, a discharge or charge, it's the unit of measurement is called um, coulombs, which is the unit of measurement of electrical charge. And actually, for um, partial discharge testing, we use something called picocoulombs which is a number times 10 to the negative 12. And at the very bottom, this is an example of what that looks like. It's a, it's a really small, fine measurement. But essentially, partial discharges are small electrical sparks or discharges that partially goes across the cable. All right. And what is it used for? Um, it's actually mostly used to detect um, splice integrity. Um, Terminatory or like essentially accessory um, workmanship integrity. Um, technically, if, uh, it can check your cable insulation, but the likelihood of it being inside the insulation is, is, is pretty low. But it can detect it. Um, causes for partial discharge? Um, again, it's mostly associated with the accessories. So um, improper tape application um, for older type of uh, accessories. Um, if you leave gaps between the tape, that could be a, a cause. Um, having bubbles in the taping, that's another cause. Um, improper heat shrinking, um, not applying the cold shrink properly, this, this is another cause. Uh, if you have air gaps, um, say between interfaces or even between the layers of the cable, you can have partial discharge. And coming back to this image that we showed earlier, um, as you can see right here, we have incomplete shrinking. We have that bubble there. And of course, that created a gap. And you have an electrical field, and you have partial discharge there. And there's a, there's even another source. There's a gap between the insulation and the the um, termination or that little heat shrink there. That could also be a source of PD. Right. So kind of going back to the insulation, um, the causes for partial discharge in insulation, say with older cables, um, could have come from some sort of delamination or voids inside your cable, um, any protrusions in the semicon layers because of the uh, extrusion process might not have been good then. Uh, there could have been impurities left inside the insulation. And all these issues are more for like older type cables. But nowadays, the manufacturing process is streamlined really well, and so you don't have these issues anymore. And um, just so you know, you can detect electrical trees with partial discharge. So if you have a Electrical tree discharging, that can be picked up with PD diagnostics. But honestly, the likelihood of picking up a partial a discharge from an electrical tree with a, a PD test is really low. And if you found it, um, you, you might want to attempt to play the lottery because you, you really got lucky on there. <laughs> but it can detect the discharges coming from the electrical tree. All right. So as for locations of partial discharges in your, say, a silk cable, or just uh, in general, there was a study done on silk cable, as I'm showing you right here, and that they found 51% uh, of the discharges were occurring in the joint. And they also found that 33% of the discharges were found in the termination. So 84% of the discharges, or partial discharges, were found in the joints and the termination. And so they were found in the accessories. And with XLPE, it's even a small number to non-existent to be inside the insulation. So this is why partial discharge diagnostics is more associated with the accessories than checking the accessories, like your, your joints, your splices, your termination. So it's checking the, the quality of the workmanship and those accessories. And the question that I would ask is, well, how do you know that this is coming from the joint or the termination? How do you know it's not coming like 500 feet down the cable as opposed to 10 feet on the cable or something? Well. Um, fortunately, partial discharge diagnostics can locate, localize the defect. It actually uses a similar technology to radar so you can know where the location is coming from, which is really nice. So um, that, that kind of summarizes some partial discharge uh, uh, causes. <laughs> and now if you want to know, if you're interested in running the test, there are, are some good terms to know for partial discharge testing. And really, I'll just have to kind of go over these. 
So we have our um, let's start with continuous versus non-continuous. So um, continuous versus non-continuous. All righty. All this is, um, say you have a waveform like your sinusoidal or your cosine rectangular, and uh, this waveform will go until you stop the test. So it will continue until you actually hit stop. Um, so that's a continuous type test. Non-continuous is something that would come with something called damp DC. It's where the um, you start the test and the waveform dies out and is zone it stops on its own. So this is typically a one-shot deal, and this is just it is not continuous because it doesn't continue on its own. That's all that is. Now there's offline versus online testing. And what this is, is your testing offline is where the cable's been de-energized. And um, online is where the cable's energized. And most of the partial discharge diagnostics are done offline, where the cable's de-energized, as opposed to online. Um, we have PD level. And PD level just means the absolute number of partial discharge. Uh, so if you say you have 1,500 picocoulombs, that's your level, 1,500. PD intensity, this is the amount of discharges at a specific location. And uh, because we have the, um, the location of it, because we have the level, because we know what intensity is, we could have something like a PD map. And so we could see at each location, and how intense it is, how high the level is, and how much is occurring. And because we could trend this data over time, we could have something called a PD pattern. Um, now we have inception voltage and extinction voltage. So inception voltage, or PDIV, all this is is the voltage level at which partial discharge starts. That's it. Extinction voltage, this is the voltage level at which PD stops. All right. So when you're coming to cables, it's actually really important to know where the partial discharge starts and where it stops. Is it above or below operating voltage? And your good good scenario is if you have PD in your cable, um, then if it's way, way above operating voltage, say it doesn't even exist until two times operating voltage or something like that, um, this is fine. Because when is your cable going to be at two times operating voltage? When is this going to happen? So um, a next scenario that you'll run into is that your partial discharge will start below operating voltage. Why is this bad? Well, this means that your cable is constantly discharging, and so it's going to lead to breakdown failures uh, probably really soon. So of course that's a bad scenario. And then we have our third scenario where the the, voltage, the partial discharge starts just above operating voltage and stops just below. Well, what can happen here is, um, say you have a transient, and it triggers this PD. Well, when does it stop? And so this scenario isn't good as well. And this is what you're looking for in cable. There are different waveforms you could use to test for partial discharge. Um, there is your continuous AC sinusoidal method and your continuous cosine rectangular method, and uh, there's something called damped AC. All right, so I'm going to go over um, these different methods or different waveform methodologies. So um, for online testing, there is uh, one method. A lot of times it's done at power frequency. And um, it has its pros and its cons because you know, power frequency, you get exactly at operating voltage, you get exactly what the cable's, um, what's happening to this cable at operating voltage. But you can't really test it further. You can only see at operating voltage. You can't be more predictive and see if it's going to happen at 1.2 times operating voltage or 2 times operating voltage. So you can't really call the substation and say, hey, can you go ahead and bring this up to 2 times operating voltage? Um, if you want to do an offline power frequency test, then again, you're running into that. I mean, it's a good test, but you're running into that power requirement. It's a really large power requirement to test your cable. And so people kind of move towards the 0.1 hertz sinusoidal unit because you, know, you can have that portable unit and do that field testing with it. But unfortunately, um, partial discharge diagnostics is frequency dependent. And because you've gone from power frequency to 0.1 hertz, again, that was 600 times difference. And so you're actually going to have a little bit of change in signature in your inception voltage and extinction voltage. So just note that you might have some changes that might not line up if you use your 0.1 hertz sinusoidal.
And so there's two other methods that come up. Um, there's one called cosine rectangular and the other one called damp AC. So cosine rectangular, again, is a point one hertz method. And um, the way that the waveform is set up is that um, you do have that point one hertz method. And I just said, you know, this test is frequency dependent and this makes it 600 times out. However, uh, the polarity crossover from positive to negative and negative to positive uh, with this waveform actually resembles your power frequency waveform or your transition. And so um, you can actually get power frequency results using this waveform and it's VLF, which is great because you have a portable unit that can get power frequency-like results. And then there's another method called damped AC. Um, this is your only non-continuous method because this waveform will die out on its own. Um, it, has, it starts out with a large voltage amplitude and it'll decay and decrease with time. And it'll stop on its own, of course. But anyway, you can actually get power frequency-like results with this one. And one of the, another benefit of damped AC is that you can see the inception voltage and the extinction voltage or where the partial discharge starts and stops in the same run, which is really nice. And uh, the frequency range, again, ranges between 20 and 300 hertz, which is on multiples of power frequency. Close multiples of power frequency. Um, here is a screenshot of a partial discharge test. And we're using our damped AC method because you can see that the voltage amplitude at the bottom it decays over time. And in this test, you can see the inception voltage. You can see the extinction voltage, which is nice. Um, you can see our PD level. We can see the intensity because all the PDs are represented at the top by the, all these little dots. And you can look at the quality of workmanship, say your joints and your termination, because you can see a little cluster of dots at 300 meters. You can see one at 600 meters. And let's say we have another joint at 800 meters. So you see no PD activity at 800 meters. So you know that joint is really, well, really done really well. And then you see 600 meters, and you're like, oh, okay, that's a little iffy. And uh, at 300 meters, that one just needs to be redone. And so you could actually uh, take preventative measures um, using this diagnostic by seeing the quality of workmanship of that slice. And you could fix it, test it again, see if it's good, and um, hopefully that could save you time and money at the same time. So essentially what I'm saying is that you can use partial discharge diagnostic to check for discharges in the splices and the terminations and of course in the inside the insulation as well if needed. Um, so you're looking at the quality of workmanship using this test. Um, it can localize the defects, which is really nice. But there is a little common misconception out there, so I just want to make this clear that partial discharge diagnostic does not detect water trees, and so this is not a good method for that. Um, 10 delta is a good method for that. All right. So um, essentially that kind of wraps up your um, partial discharge diagnostics. Um, and hopefully um, you'll have a, a good idea of what's going on with the different tests. But um, I really want to give a, a quick synopsis because I know that was a bunch of information that I just gave you. And so um, I'm going to go over quickly what these tests were again. And, um, so starting with with sand testing, of course, essentially this is basically a pass-fail test, a high pot test that accelerates the already existing aging condition in the cable. Um, 10 delta is used to look at the quality and the health of the cable, and you can actually trend the data over time and see how the cable ages over time. And as for partial discharge diagnostics, it checks for the discharges and the quality of workmanship and the splices and the terminations. And so, um, essentially, the, so 10 delta can tell you the, the quality of the cable, and partial discharge can tell you the quality of the workmanship and the splices and terminations. And the withstand test can accelerate any aging condition that's already presently there within a nice scheduled and controlled environment so that the cable could be fixed or repaired. So as you can see, with like each test, with partial discharge, with 10 delta, and the withstand test, they all complement you know, complement each other, and they all have like a different, slightly different purpose. But overall, by testing your system, you're testing its reliability, and you're testing the integrity of it, and of course you can increase, increase the reliability and integrity of your system by doing these tests. <laughs> anyway, so I'm kind of hoping with this that um, the big question of uh, which test do I use if I need to check like the terminations or the cable health or quality um, has been answered, hopefully.
<laughs> I do hope this information has been helpful. But um, again, if there's any more questions left, um, is there any other questions here? Uh, are we good? Uh, yeah, we have a whole bunch actually. We might <laughs> run out of time. Okay. So let's, let's start back uh, um, on the withstand test. So you had mentioned that the DC high pot test is no longer recommended by the IEEE. So then what should we use to replace that? Okay. So um, yeah, if you uh, replace it with an AC test. And so you could use the very low frequency AC test to um, now test your cables. And it works well with both laminated cables that are extruded, so it works fine with your PILT cable, your EPR, and your XLPE. Okay. And is it true that if we just ground the cable after DC testing, it will actually get rid of all the, the space charge? Um, I'm going to give a yes and no answer to that. So, um, a lot, of course, um, you could dissipate the charges by grounding the, the cable, but a lot of people don't dissipate it long enough, and so that charge could actually stay in there. And you'd really need something like a micro and meter to check to see if all the charges were released or dissipated. And sometimes it, they don't dissipate all on their own. They just kind of stay in there. So it can happen. It doesn't happen all the time. And most of the time, people don't put on the um, grounding stick long enough for that to happen. And still, if you have an AC method, it's just overall, it's much more safe. And again, if you're using DC, there's potentially a passing that bad cable because sometimes it doesn't even pick up the fault. Mm -hmm. um, and if a 10 delta test doesn't localize defects, how do we find out where they are? Yeah, unfortunately, you can't tell where they are. Um, and so you just kind of have to look at overall, at the overall quality of your cable using those charts. And this is kind of also this is kind of where your withstand test can kind of complement the tan delta test. So say if you have high numbers with your tan delta and you really want to kind of push this cable to repair it and replace the bad section, so you can bring the withstand test in and accelerate the aging condition. And if it's fault, then you can go local, do fault location and patch the area before it puts it in service and before it fails in service. Um, okay, so should an acceptance test include everything, the VLF, the 10 delta, and the PD. Is there any value to having all this baseline data when you're trying to accept a cable? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, withstand testing is great because you could um, check the quality of the, you could really push the terminations and those joints um, when you're doing that and making sure they're okay. Um, your partial discharge will check the quality of the terminations that are just put on and fresh as, as well as the joint. So I definitely recommend that. Um, and then, of course, tan delta. This is where uh, I get a lot of debate. Um, some people want to see that baseline information, and it should just be a straight line all the way across, um, just a low straight line. And some people like to see a baseline like that just so, so they can build off of it and trend it. And some people say, you know, my cable is good enough. I know it's a brand new cable. I'm expecting a line. What do I need from it? But it, it takes, um, I mean, it's less than 10 minutes to do, and it's a really gentle test. And so um, I would just, I, I personally like doing that with acceptance testing. And of course, there's two other tests with acceptance testing or commissioning testing that I would recommend. Um, there's one called sheath testing that checks the jacket. And so if you just freshly pulled this cable, and you say you get rocks in it, or someone like you get a contractor that tried to pull the cable and they cut the jacket. Well, now that leaves an open spot, and so you can get moisture ingress quicker. And if you've done the sheath test, it will find that hole and say, "Hey, I have an opening right here," and you can patch that before it causes future problems. And then there's conductor resistance testing, which will make sure the joint is properly um, connected. I mean, partial discharge could fix that up as well. But if you're there in the hole, the manhole. Um, Making that you could just do a quick check that takes a few seconds. So I know those are a bit verbose, but I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what is the advantages of the damp AC method? Advantage of damp AC is that you could see um, the inception voltage and the extinction voltage in the same shot, which is really helpful um, because the way the test typically is performed. Uh, with the other waveforms like sinusoidal or crescent rectangular, is that they have to start kind of low with the voltage and they 
as they step up, they're checking for inception, checking for inception, as, and they keep on stepping up and up and up. And with the um, damp AC, um, you just start with the voltage kind of high, and it dampens over time, so you get the inception voltage and the extinction voltage without having to do all the steps. Um, another advantage of damp AC kind of comes with aged cables. And so um, say you're doing like a 15-minute test, uh, just looking for partial discharge, because sometimes it could take a while to collect data. Then um, say 15 minutes using cosine rectangular, it's almost like doing a withstand test, or it can almost be similar to doing a withstand test. And so um, you can have potential of triggering any PD or doing that small bit of acceleration during that time with an age cable. And so people are like, oh, let's just go ahead and go to damp AC because it's really gentle. It's a one-shot deal. You won't trigger anything with that. And so people tend to like damp AC with aged cables and like cosine rectangular more for acceptance when you're doing partial discharge testing. So those are some advantages. It doesn't trigger um, anything. It doesn't like create some sort of withstand test. And it shows you the extinction voltage and, and the exception voltage um, in the same run. Okay. okay, we are running really close to time, so I think we have to wrap up. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, we'll follow up individually with you via email after the presentation. Um, right. If we will email a copy of this presentation to you in the next few weeks, and the recording of the session will also be available online on our website uh, within two weeks of this webinar. When we close the webinar, you'll be redirected to a survey. Um, we will really appreciate it if you fill it out and give us a feedback so that we can continue to improve our webinar series. So we thank you all for attending and have a great weekend. Right. Thank you for your time.